Dr. Johnny Sins at your cervix. <laughs> Welcome one and all to another round of the book reviews. Today, I'm going to be reviewing the book for you, Superbugs by Matt McCarthy. Now, just diving straight into this, why did I want to read this book? Well, I first heard of this in episode 166, 166 of the Sam Harris podcast, Making Sense, where they talked about this book and I found the author, Matt McCarthy, to be quite knowledgeable, to be quite interesting. And so I said to myself, yep, I want to know more about this. I want to know more about antibiotics and why, what are these superbugs and should, how worried should I be about them? So the book was published in 2019 and it circles around the clinical trial of Dalbavancin, which is a, was a new type of antibiotic being introduced into the US medical healthcare system. Uh, but it's also mixed with the history of antibiotics. So he talks about Alexander Fleming, a bunch of other people as well, but Alexander Fleming, the um, creator, the discoverer of penicillin is the most interesting of those. I think the relationship uh, as well with his mentor, Tom Walsh, who is a, a like an older doctor. So he's, you know, he speaks a lot about him very praisingly of, of, of his mentor uh, and the science of antibiotics and why superbugs develop. So the themes in the book, the way the book is set out as well, it's 40 chapters and it goes through, uh, it just jumps from chapter to chapter. So one chapter, he'll be talking about a patient and their story. Another, he'll be talking about penicillin. Another, he'll be talking about how he discovered, uh, you know, someone else told him about this new type of drug that explodes bacteria and things like this. So it's, uh, it's a little bit all over the place narrative wise. I mean, it still follows a general trend talking about this trial that he did of this new antibiotic, but it does include a lot of different things. So the themes of the book, I thought that the healthcare incentives was a, a pretty interesting thing. I wouldn't say it was the theme that was trying to be conveyed, but that's what I got out from it. And it really just got me asking like, what drives this industry? So I thought financial was, was pretty clear up there on terms of what it actually is. So new drugs cost too much essentially. And he talks about this in the book where bring a new drug to market, like the present net present value of a new drug is actually in the negative, like millions in the negative, because the problem is you, you bring a new drug to market, but it can very quickly, quickly become ineffective with these superbugs, i.e. the bacteria, which develop a resistance to it and then keep going and keep going so that your new, your new drug is essentially useless. So it costs an absurd amount of money. I think he mentioned a billion dollars to bring a new drug, to create a new drug. I'm not sure exactly how true that is, but you can imagine the whole process of finding new microbes in the soil, testing them, finding which one affects which bacteria, you know, this whole testing process, then finding out, okay, which form can we deliver this to people in a tablet and a pill and an injection in a vapor, whatever it is. And then continuing on then with the trials, going through all the different steps you needed to get through the FDA, this is in the US, the Federal Drug Agency, to eventually get to market and then hope, hope that the doctors aren't too against it or that it has too many side effects. So it's just absurd the, the costs involved. And I guess the incentives then are like, okay, well, how can you incentivize drug makers to actually make these drugs? So you can give out longer patents, you can give out subsidies to, to companies that are actually involved in the process of making new drugs, but those carry their own risks as well because then you'll get companies that you know, might say they're inventing a new drug only just to get tax benefits or whatever. So the, the whole finances involved up in this were insanely difficult. Political as well, and who gets treated is really based up upon opinion. Here's a story in the book of this firefighter in 9-11 who inhaled a bunch of carcinogens in, from the flames and the smoke and the heat of the buildings. And a bunch of these firefighters and medical and uh, emergency professionals on that day who got ended up getting cancer or very sick from this. And it was sort of like, okay, that, and they would then get financial help from the government to help pay for their, their costs and related things. But, you know, what do you do with the person who, the, the World War II veteran who, you know, ended up, you know, 
could be even the same thing, Ga- getting gassed in the trenches or whatnot, comes back and maybe he's not a hero because he was participating in the Vietnamese war. So, you know, what, what do you do with that? And it just seemed pretty arbitrary about, you know, this person gets this or this person gets this um, just based on like the political will of the constituents of, or, you know, I can do this to get the white vote or the black vote or the Latino vote or the, the firefighter vote or whatever it is. And it just, yeah, it just screamed out to me as being quite um, unfair in a way, but you know, that's, that's life. Life is bloody unfair. Uh, emotional as well as another, a, a big, driving of of what the the incentives that drive the healthcare and so people are willing to ex- sacrifice uh, inordinately so here's just a hypothetical for you uh, you know say there was a button your mum's deadly ill she's dying you've got a little bit of time before she passes away and then a button is presented to you and if you press this button she instantly recovers basically but it kills half the people in the world there's a lot of people, probably including me, who would seriously consider that and and then decide, you know, maybe I'm just going to do it. You know, she's in such pain. The the grief, the, the immediacy of her pain right in front of you could cause you to act in ways which is what we would all say is pretty, pretty damn negative, killing, you know, 3.5 billion people. So obviously that's a, a little bit exaggerated. That's a hypothetical, but there's still things that sort of go on like that, such as a very rich person who decides to spend millions and millions of dollars to extend their life by maybe one year, two years, when that same amount of money could have been used to save, let's say, millions of Africans in, in um, you know, through a simple um, vaccination of some sort or help millions of people with lung cancer or stomach cancer or whatever it is. So... It's just the emotional aspect, I guess, is what really drives healthcare as well. And, you know, it's not necessarily a good thing, but it is something that needs to be taken into account. The other theme that really came out from the book for me was the real world ethics. And it's just a minefield from big to small that the doctors have to deal with day in, day out. One of them, the small ones, for example, is informed consent. So how do you go about making sure that the person who you're trying to, to get to participate in a trial knows the risks when they are informed, they might not even have the capacity intellectually to understand w- the risks that are involved. And then there's also the, you know, the incapacity of potentially they're on drugs, potentially they're too stressed out, potentially they didn't really understand, potentially it goes on and on. And so there was just a little snippet which I found quite interesting which he repeated throughout the book was when someone he's gone through all the documentation and the person would have to sign instead of him saying sign here he says you would sign here so making it a conditional as if it's not a imperative that they they actually do it it's not him pushing in the back so that's just you know two words that change the very slightly change the meaning of a sentence but that's the sort of things that they need to consider to make sure that informed that the consent is, you know, as informed as possible. Then you get on to the the real bigger stuff, the Tuskegee uh, Tuskegee syphilis study if you haven't heard of this, basically in oh, I'm going to say like the 1950s, 60s, 70s, somewhere around that period, the a study was set up to measure the actually might even be earlier 1945, I think it was around the World War 2. The, they set up a study to measure the the path that syphilis takes when untreated. And they basically got, and it was very racially motivated as well, so they got a bunch of, of black men usually from this community in Tuskegee, Tuskegee, wherever the hell that is in the US. And they, even though the study turned in to be like a lifelong thing, so they got a couple of hundred people and... They even when penicillin and these other methods of treating syphilis became available, the doctors intentionally either lied or did not tell them about these these alternative ways or like what is the current cutting edge of medicine to treat this disease because they wanted to see what would happen over the long period. 
So essentially they were treating them as human guinea pigs, just letting them go and and most of them dying from a syphilis related thing, which could have been treated. And this wasn't just, you know, one manic doctor who conceived this harebrained scheme. No, it was overseen by different people coming in at different times, taking control of the study. It was overseen by boards of doctors who agreed, yes, we'll continue the study. So it was just from top to bottom, bad decisions, bad, bad ethical decisions all along the way, which ended up in resulting in, you know, human experimentation, the sort of shit the Nazis did. So, you know, it's, uh, it just got me thinking, you know, how many things like this are still going on and how many of these sorts of things have just been lost to time that will never be talked about, never known where there was you know, just as bad things occurring. So, uh, the real world ethics of the medical and healthcare industry is just, Oh, I feel feel for doctors. Yeah, there's a reason why there's doctors are um, synonymous with a stressful job. It's because you are making those those ethical decisions. Juan and I talk about hypotheticals, but you know we're not out there saving lives, doing the the actual you know the hard, dirty work that's needed, making the hard decisions. Triage, for example, is just when you think it, when you get down to it, it's a very brutal system of okay, I'm going to do the most good that I can do in a situation where people have their limbs missing. I'm going to have to let people die because I can maybe save other people. Brutal, absolutely brutal. So my personal observations, uh, it's, I, I had a lot of empathy after reading this book for doctors, but it was tinged with a wariness as well. Um, the long hours, the stress, the chronic and acute stress that, that they have, the in, inability to help all, you know, terrible parts of their their job but you know i can see how it could create like power complexes or overconfidence or just these positions where they are potentially in the expert and then not 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 knowing everything and he talks about how he's constantly reading constantly updating you know it's it's pretty pretty hard and then you take in the fact that they're just a human as well and they make emotional decisions it's uh, uh yeah I w- uh, it's it's good to trust oscars i think it's good to trust doctors but it's also you know they're not infallible as well and it's it's important to remember that it revealed my own risk profile reading this book as well which is extremely cautious uh i don't think i'm ever going to be saying pick me pick me i'm i want to do the clinical trial of this untested drug or largely untested drug and they have systems in place you know you have to test it on animals first you have to do it and you know it's a a small group of people first then a larger one and then all this stuff but ah man i think for me personally unless i'm in a very dire desperate situation i'm just not going to be the the guinea pig so that was interesting the the last real observation was the amount of hand touching in this book he talks so many times how He's going in, he's shaking hands with the doctor or, you know, his mentor and he's in this hospital and he touches the person on the shoulder to give them relief or give them a hug. And sometimes he mentions how he puts on gloves, but especially since the coronavirus and, you know, the spreading of that, it is just every every time I saw that in the book, I just went, man, no wonder there is, uh, I don't know how factual this is. I, I think it's factual enough that, if you go to a hospital, you can get even sicker in there just because they have the super bugs in there. They have people spreading from one place to the other. If you've got a huge amount of in- sick, infectious people in one place, it's going to spread. So, yeah, it-, it made me very wary of hospitals as well. And it's like the long, the least amount of time you can spend in one of them, the better. So, in summary, it's a smooth narrative that will scare you shitless of, of germs and, and hospitals in general. It had some really heart-rending stories or heartbreaking stories from the patients who, you know, they, they had their own particular story and each one of them had a particular story, um, which, which was, you know, at times just very, very sad to see that, you know, this person is probably going to die, this person's not going to make it, this person has been let down by themselves, by the community, by the the society we live in, and that's just the way it is. But all of this, again, mixed with science and mixed with history. So my only real problem from this is it's just not going to leave a lasting impression on me. The book was 
interesting to know more about how a clinical trial is done, some of the considerations that go into it, but it's not a classic. I'm not going to remember this in, you know, two years time, let alone 10 or 20. So uh, I'm giving the book Superbugs by Matt McCarthy a six out of 10. What's something pragmatic I'm going to take from it? I am really going to stop shaking hands, I think. I, I, I'm i definitely, I've been doing a lot more of the fist bump since coronavirus has been introduced and I think I want to try and continue that. I just, it's making me very wary of bugs and and germs and the spreading of that sort of thing. So uh, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this session, this book review from Dr. Michael here with my uh, face mask on. If you're wondering why I, I, I did that funny thing at the at the start, it's because I was wearing a face mask and I wanted to do a joke. So check out the video, people. It's good stuff. Other than that, if you enjoy the video, you can also get it in the form of purely audio in any of the podcasting platforms. If you can leave a comment or a view or anything like that, that would be awesome. Very much appreciated. And what do you think about the medical healthcare system? Do you think the incentives are a little bit whack? Do you think that doctors have an impossible job or that they could do and should do better lots of questions to be raised let me know if you're you're interested by any of them other than that i'm going to leave it there dr michael out